Welcome to MYPC's first dinner and lecture. Uh, for those who don't know, MYPC stands for Muslim Youth of Professional Court. So to start up today's events, we're gonna have the reading of the Quran from two of our youngest members. We're gonna have first Zahra, who will recite Ayatul Kursi. Then we're going to have Sajid read, and he'll be reciting Surah Al-Shams. Allahu, I mean, Assalamu alaikum. Um, Audu min al-Shaytan al-Rajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Allahu la ilaha illa yuul hayal kaim. La ta kudhu sinatan wa la naum. La hu maafis samawati wa maafil ard. Manzo lazi yashfa induhu. Illa bi isni yagamu ma baina aidihe wa ma kafuhum. Wallahi hi tuma bi shayim elmihi. Illa bi masha wa siya kursi yuha samawati wallard. Wallahi odhu hifsahoma wa huwa alyo lazim. Assalamu alaikum. Audhu billahi mina shaitan rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim. والشمس والدها والقمر إذا تلاها والنهار إذا جلاها والليل إذا يغشاها والسماء وما بناها والأرض وما تهاها والنفس وما صواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلها ما زكها وقد خاب ما دسها كذبت ثمود بتقواها إذ انبعث أشقاها فقال لهم رسول الله ناقة الله وسقياها فكذبوه فعكروها فدمدم عليهم ربهم بذنبهم فسواها ولا يخاف كباها So, we, the MYPC, are a group that is dedicated to the Muslim youth and developing their knowledge through education in Islam and involvement in the community. We're committed to making a difference not only in the lives of the Muslim youth, but the Muslim community as well. In the future, um, on June 4th, we will hope to hold a lecture again. So June 4th is just before the beginning of Ramadan. And for that lecture, our speaker will be Sheikh Musle Khan. And so you'll have to purchase tickets for that dinner, and this one is free, of course. And after that, uh, after Ramadan and after Eid, we'll hope to hold more events, inshallah. So I'll pass things off to Brother Shazad, as he would like to explain some more. Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. Alhamdulillah, I'm happy to see all of you come out to support the, the youth of this masjid and in the community, alhamdulillah. It is an important thing, if some of you remember last time, I had about five minutes, two minutes. Sorry. This is Musler, Sheikh Musler calling me here for some reason. But as you all remember, uh, the importance of focusing on our youth, our Muslim youth, for the things that we're facing in our community today, uh, they need to be prepared for it. And not only prepared for it, but they need to stand up and defend the deen of Islam. The other day, a uh, university student, who it was his first year, Muslim, Muslim brother, young Muslim teen, first year in university, and the professor, he told them, first date has nothing to do with religion, 
it was an engineering class and the teacher says anyone who believes in God here challenge me right now and if you still believe in God after that then I don't want you in this classroom these are the kind of things that our youth are facing today and our boys and girls need to have that conviction and be courageous and be brave to de defend and stand up for their deen. This is what they're facing with out there, um, the, the, the youth today. And this is why I feel it's very important that we ask our youth what uh, are the important topics they would like to hear about. And this is how we came about with this topic, uh, Do You Believe in Miracles? Because obviously out there, miracles are something that is fables. So this is how, we, and all the, the lectures coming up, our, our youth are the ones choosing these lectures. And right away, um, I thought about our Sheikh um, and brother, Dr. Shabir Ali. And uh, me and him have a long history. <laughs> uh, he is perhaps, he's one of my first teachers. And uh, just as how I'm trying to mentor our youth here, he did that to us once. And I remember a, a funny story. Uh, back then I wasn't dressed like this with the, the, the topi and the thobe. And I had an argument, I don't know if he remembers, right? Or debate with him, me debating him, right? <laughs> debate with him that I want to wear my jeans and my cap and everything and I will, I will give a presentation. Because he was encouraged us to give presentations as Naeem just did for us. So that I guess we would develop our public speaking. And I was telling him, no, I want to wear my cap and jeans. Perhaps people will accept my message more. And he was encouraging me, no, you should dress properly as Muslims should dress. And subhanAllah, I remember that. I was like 16, maybe 14 at that time. So <laughs> we have a long history, alhamdulillah. Uh, so may Allah bless him. Now, uh, everyone, to really introduce him, uh, Dr. Shabir Ali, um, that might take up the whole time of the lecture. But uh, mashallah, he's known for his, his standing in the forefront um, uh, in defending this deen, in debating with uh, um, um, atheists and Christians and so on. Uh, he is the president of the Dawa Center downtown, da down at Dufferin and Bloor. And he also is a professor at the University of Toronto. Um, I will not delay him anymore, inshallah. The program, brothers and sisters, is we will, we will have the lecture right now. After that, we will try to leave some time for question and answer. And then we will fill our bellies, inshallah with the food, inshallah. Zakala khair. Without further ado, Dr. Shabir Ali. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salawatullahi wa salamuhu ala khatamin nabiyyin. Wa ala alihi tayyibin tahirin. Wa ala azwajihi wa mahati al-mu'mineen. Wa ala ashabihi wa ajma'een. Wa ala tabi'ina wa man tabi'ahum bi isan la yawmiddin. I'd like to thank uh, Sheikh Shazad for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here before you. And yes, we do have a long history, but I said to him by phone a few weeks ago uh, that uh, if I was his teacher once, now he will be my teacher of the Arabic language. Uh, because having spent uh, time abroad and uh, being immersed in the Arabic language, uh, definitely he can teach me a thing or two. I want to thank Imam Shabir for giving me the opportunity to speak here at his platform. He is the Imam here, and uh, if I speak here, I only speak with his uh, permission. And if I say anything wrong, he has the uh, full right to correct me on the spot or uh, later on. Of course, anyone has the full right to correct me. I'm a human being. I may say some good things, but I can make uh, mistakes as well. And uh, I only learn by uh, listening to feedback. So. The topic for tonight is, uh, the, do you believe in miracles? This is how uh, Sheikh Shazad put it, do you believe in miracles? Uh, and uh, he wanted me, of course, to address the Quran as a miracle from God. And uh, now I understand more fully uh, how the question has arisen. Uh, our youth uh, want to know how to answer that uh, engineering teacher uh, or that professor. Our youth need to know how to answer the man on the street. You need to know if you're traveling with somebody on the bus and the person beside you asks you, how do you know that the Quran really is the word of God? How do you answer that person? 
Now, of course, uh, on many occasions, you will uh, say that you are doing things because the Quran says so. We're just about uh, how many weeks away from Ramadan? About six, five weeks? Something like this? Five weeks? So we're very close, right? And uh, we're going to be fasting in Ramadan. And somebody will ask you, why are you fasting? So you will say, okay, because the Quran tells us to fast. But then, why do you have to listen to the Quran? You'll say, because the Quran is the word of God. And then the question comes back to, how do you know that the Quran is the word of God? So that's what we want to answer tonight. I'll try to answer that in about 40 minutes. And then uh, we'll, we'll go back to the Master of Ceremonies to uh, advise us on what happens next. Either we take your question right away uh, or we go to as Sheikh Shazad said after the brain food we go to the other food right so for the brain food how do we know the Quran is the word of Allah Azawajal? let me offer seven uh, points in this regard and if we have time perhaps I'll add an eighth so my top seven reasons then now, if anyone were to uh, look at the Quran, they would see this looks like an ordinary book, right? They, they are like books, like it's bound in, in pages together. So uh, every book we know is authored by some human individual or some individuals combined. So one might think at first glance the Quran must also have a human author. Okay, so let's go back in history to find out who was this human author, whom will they find? They will pick on the Prophet Muhammad wasallam because historically he is the first person known to be broadcasting this message of the Quran. And it would seem to historians as though uh, he is the author of this book. Either he wrote it himself, he memorized it, and now he's preaching it to the crowds, or he preached it to the crowds and then his followers noted it down and collected it into the book. And so he essentially is the author of the message in this book. So now we want to test that hypothesis. Either he is the author of this book like this, or he is receiving this message from an outside source, which we will identify as the mind of God. So my top seven reasons for thinking that this is not simply the work of a man and that it is a revelation from the Almighty God is that first, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was known in history to be sincere in what he believed and what he preached. Now the difference this makes is that while a man may be sincerely wrong, he might sincerely believe a thing, but he's still wrong about what he believes. If we know that the Prophet, peace be upon him, is sincere, that doesn't prove right away that the Quran is the word of God, but it proves that he was not trying to fool people. And that makes a lot of difference. Because let's say somebody knows, I'm going to concoct this book, and I'm just going to tell people that it is from God in order to get them to be good, to be upright. For good, noble purpose, but he knows he's doing it. So when he knows he's doing it, he's going to try in every which way to make the message sound palatable to people. On the other hand, what we find is that the Prophet Muhammad is preaching the message without any consideration for whether people are going to like it or lump it. And, and we see that, for example, in the 10th chapter of the Quran, uh, there, there, there is this dialogue between him and his skeptics. In fact, throughout the Quran, you find this dialogue. Uh, the Quran is saying, they say this, you tell them this. So it, the, even the questions and the skepticisms and the objections of the others are mentioned in the Quran and also answered. So one of the requests from the others is, uh, either you bring us a different Quran other than this one, or change it. Then they're saying, then we're going to believe. So what should have been, if the Prophet, peace be upon him, is just trying to get his people to reform, what might he do? He might decide to change it a little bit, right? But what is the answer from the Quran? The answer from the Quran, from a, an outside mind to the mind of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is say, tell them this. It is not of my accord to change it. I only recite it to you as it is being revealed to me. And moreover, the Quran keeps repeating that the Prophet, peace be upon him, in fact, would suffer dire consequences if he were to try in any way to forge anything in this book. The 69th chapter of the Quran is called al haqqa uh, meaning the, the event, uh, the, the reality as it will come to pass. And at the end of that surah, the, the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself is, is threatened. In the words of Allah saying to him, وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْضَ الْأَقَاوِيلِ 
if he were to try and forge some sayings and attribute these to God, we are going to then seize him by the right hand and then cut off his artery. It's very serious. Now we know that sometimes people tell little lies. You know, somebody doesn't want to go to work that morning and calls in and says, you know, I'm not feeling very well. And meanwhile, he's planning to go to the mall. A little lie, right? But if somebody calls in and says, oh, I can't come into work today but because my grandmother died. Uh, you know, that, that's a big one. And, and some people would not tell a lie like that because they are worried if they say that, maybe the grandmother will die. <laughs> So, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is going about preaching his message, and part of the message is also that if I were to forge this by myself and say that it is from God, God is going to cut off my artery. He better be sure that what he's saying really is from God. So that's the point, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, is sincere. He sincerely believes that. And it's not just me saying this because I happen to be a Muslim. This is the judgment of historical scholars who are not Muslims. For example, William Montgomery Watt, a scholar from uh, Edinburgh, the university there in Scotland, uh, he has written many books on Islam, including a book entitled Muhammad, Prophet, and Statesman. And in that book, he outlined several reasons for thinking that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was sincere. One of the reasons, uh, the most obvious one to all of us, is that when the Prophet, peace be upon him, was preaching in Mecca, Remember, he, that's his birthplace, and he was preaching there for 13 long years from the time he first got the revelation until he eventually migrated. During those years, he was persecuted, he and his followers. And in fact, he had only a few followers. And from, from a human point of view, it doesn't look like this is going to get anywhere. If he, is, he, if he has some delusions of grandeur, if he is hoping that he will become a great leader, he will gather many followers, or he just simply wants to change society, it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. Only a few followers, many of them are people of very little influence. Some of them were slaves when they embraced Islam. They were being beaten and tortured, as we know in the case of uh, Bilal radiallahu an. And yet the Prophet, peace be upon him, persisted. If you've seen some movies, you know, somebody's being tortured and this person is holding out, he, he, he's not giving up and is not saying what they want him to say, and he's being tortured some more. Eventually, what did they do? They say, we can't break this guy. Bring his loved ones. Let, let's, you know, persecute the colleague because while he is strong himself and he can bear his own torture, he's not going to allow for his loved ones to be tortured. Then he will speak. The loved ones of the Prophet ﷺ was bearing this were bearing this persecution. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, maintained the same position as before. This is just a revelation coming to me from the Almighty God. I'm just delivering it as it comes. I have no special interest in this. He himself is just, in a way, helpless in this whole situation. And his helplessness was reflected in the dua that he made when he came out of Taif. Taif is the place where they stoned him and his feet bled. And when he came out to the outskirts to a position of safety, then he prayed to Allah Azawajal, saying, Ya Rab, I only desire your countenance, your face. I only desire your pleasure. And if that is assured, then all of this suffering is easy for me. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, is known to have been sincere. He wasn't trying to fool anybody. He was just delivering the message as it came. That explains to us why in the Quran we find that the Prophet ﷺ uh, is not shown to be of such a, a, a miracle performing wonder as Isa ﷺ was. Look into the Quran. What does the Quran say is, its, is the greatest miracle of the Prophet ﷺ? It is the Quran itself. What are the miracles of Isa salam in the Quran? The name Isa is mentioned 25 times in the Quran. Two surahs of the Quran give us a detailed narrative of the birth of Isa salam. The third surah and also the 19th surah, which incidentally is named Surat Maryam, the 19th chapter of the Quran. Surat Maryam bears the name Mary because that's the mother of Jesus. And in these surahs, we find that the angel comes to Mary and says, you will have a child. And she says, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? And then she is being told 
Thus says the Lord, in effect. إِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَكُونُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ When God decides a thing, He only says to it, be, and it becomes. So from these narratives, Muslims conclude, generally, that Isa a.s. was born uh, of a virgin mother, thus aligning the Muslim belief close to that of our Christian friends. But that was not said about our Prophet Muhammad Something special to Christians and it is conceded in the Quran. The Quran says that Isa salam, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was raising the dead and curing the blind and the leper. So these are miracles that were not attributed to our Prophet salam, in the Quran. Imagine the Prophet Muhammad now. Wasallam, he wants to concoct a book if that's what people think he wants to do and uh, he, instead of praising himself in the book he's praising somebody else he's saying look at this great guy who performed all of those marvelous miracles one sees here the sincerity of the Prophet Wasallam. he's not fudging this book to make him come, himself come out good but he is actually giving due credit to Isa salam, where it is due. He is just simply delivering the message as it is being inspired into his mind. That's only our first point so far, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sincere. And that by itself does not prove that it is the word of God being revealed to him because a man might be sincere in his belief, but yet he could be severely mistaken. But my other points will show that not only the Prophet, peace be upon him, was sincere, but he was correct in his uh, judgment. Because now let's continue. My second point is from psychology. Imagine the psychology of the Prophet ﷺ. Think about the mind of this person now, and think of what the Quran does. The Quran speaks from the vantage point of another mind, not the mind of the Prophet ﷺ. For example, the Quran says, Nahnu khalaqunakum. We created you. Who is the we here? Is it the Prophet, peace be upon him? No, some other mind is, is saying, We created you. That mind is also addressing the Prophet, peace be upon him. You know the surahs that begin with the word kol? You know four of them, right? Kol ya al kafirun, kol hu Allahu ahad, kol a'udhu bi rabbil falak. And what's the last one? Kol a'udhu bi rabbil nas. So, uh, these surahs, when it says kol, that's in the singular. It's addressing the Prophet ﷺ directly. Many other passages are addressing him. Clearly enough, the Quran, for example, says, Ya ayyuhan nabi, O Prophet. The Quran is addressing the Prophet. Sometimes the Quran is addressing us believers, O you who believe. Sometimes the Quran is addressing humankind, Ya ayyuhan nas. But sometimes the Quran is addressing the Prophet ﷺ him directly, commanding him, Utlu, recite, Balig, proclaim the message. So he's being commanded by an, uh, another voice. If that was his own voice speaking to himself and commanding himself, then one might want to say that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was a madman speaking to himself. However, history has noted him down as one of the sages of old. Even those who do not believe in him will recognize that he was a sane person, he was a capable leader, and, and one of the wisdom figures of ancient history. Michael Hart is a Christian and is the author of a book entitled The 100, a ranking of the most influential persons in history. In that book, he placed our Prophet وسلم, as number one out of the 100. This is like 100 of the, of the most influential pe persons of all time identified by this historian. And of the 100, he's placed the Prophet وسلم, as number one of the 100. Now he has to explain why. In his introduction, he says, I have to explain because being a Christian, people are going to question my affinity to Jesus. Why did I place Muhammad before Jesus? So he explains. He says, of all of these individuals, Muhammad, I, I have to add here, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the only one of these 100 who was supremely successful in both the religious and secular spheres at once. See, some of these people were great military leaders or great politicians, but, and some were great religious figures as history would have Isa alayhi salam. 
but not as a political leader. Our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, combined success in both fields, in both segments of life. And so he was uh, placed number one. So he was a sane person, a capable leader, and, and not a madman. But if the Quran was coming from his own mind, one would have to say that this was a person talking to himself. <laughs> and and not, not just once or twice, but you know, he writes a whole book in which he's talking to himself. It seems odd for us to conclude that way. The better conclusion is that, as Muslims believe, this is a revelation from the Almighty God, from another mind, speaking to the mind of the Prophet wasallam, and he just simply acted as the conduit to deliver that message to humankind. Now I move on to my third point. The third point is about the ability of the Prophet wasallam himself to write. The Quran addresses him as an Nabiul Ummi, as the unlettered prophet. Unlettered. He wasn't schooled to read or write. There were people at his time who were experts at producing, moving poetry and other such compositions. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, was not part of that school or that movement. Uh, or, or that field of activity. Now you know that in almost any field of activity, in order to rise to the top, you need to start from below. You know, we have our youth starting out here, and eventually one of them will be standing here in the future speaking to you uh, better than I can, can, can speak. So they start young, and they go through that process, eventually they develop. Our Prophet ﷺ was not known to be part of that process at all. And suddenly he comes reciting this book, so how did he compose a book like this? The, the Quran actually has, uh, is known now to be the first uh, book in Arabic. It is the first Arabic book. Can you imagine that? So uh, normally people start, even the books develop. Something starts small, you know, somebody writes a page, and then somebody else writes a, something that might qualify as a pamphlet, and then the pamphlet grows, it becomes like a thick book, but, but, you know, it doesn't have a spine at the back. It's stapled together. And then eventually, you know, we see like a big book like this with, with a spine. How did this become the first Arabic book produced from the mind of an unlettered person? All of this goes to show that this is not the work of the Prophet ﷺ himself, but it is being revealed to him from the Almighty God. So that's my third point. My fourth point. The Quran speaks about the, fu the, the future, and, and the future unfolds exactly as already uh, delineated in the Quran. And since God is the only one who knows the future, this is a piece of evidence that the Quran is a revelation from the Almighty God. It's not made up by the mind of the Prophet, peace be upon him. For example, the 30th chapter of the Quran is entitled Surah to Rum, a chapter of the Romans. And that chapter begins by saying, The Romans have been defeated in a nearby land or in the lowest land. And then the Quran continues in that passage to say that within a few years, uh, the Romans will get a victory by the grace of God. And at the same time, the, the believers will be delighting in the help that comes from God. Sayyid Abu Allah Maududi in his Tafhim al-Qur'an, his meaning of the Qur'an, translated from Urdu into English, it says that when one considers the dates, one realizes that this passage was uttered in the year 614. That said the Romans had suffered a defeat, defeat. And the Qur'an is saying that within a few years, the Romans will get a victory. People could not imagine that this would happen because the Romans were so thoroughly defeated by the Persians. Now the Arabic word for few can mean anywhere from three to nine. And it turns out that in the year 623, the Romans, surprising everyone, turned around and defeated the Persians. But what was also happening in the year 623? That was the year, one year after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ, when he left Mecca where he was being persecuted. And in Medina, he was still being attacked by the persecutors. So he had to defend himself and his people by meeting their persecutors at a place called Badr. 
That's where was fought the battle known as the Battle of Badr, where the Muslims were few and ill-equipped, but they defeated a lot of attacked them, several attacked them several times their number and fully equipped for battle. They were also delighting in the victory that came from God. So this chapter was saying that the Romans are going to win their victory in a few years, and at the same time, the believers will be delighted in the victory that will come from God. Said Abdullah al Maudid says, look at that. It's really talking about two separate battles occurring in two different lands by different players. How could anyone predict in advance that these two events are going to happen and happen at the same time? This is a revelation from the Almighty God, and that's my fourth point. My fifth point is that as the Quran speaks about the future, it also talks about past history and often insists that this is information coming to the Prophet, peace be upon him, from the unseen sources. In fact, in the 11th chapter of the Quran, the 49th verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directly addressing the Prophet, peace be upon him, and says, Tilka min anba'il ghaybi nuhiha ilayk. This is information that we reveal to you. Ma kunta ta'lamuha anta wa la qawmuka min qabli hadha. Neither you nor your people knew it prior to this. Again, you have to remember that the Prophet, peace be upon him, had uh, skeptics and people ready to pounce on him, to either spit on him or throw dust on him or jeer him from a distance or even stone him. Uh, so, uh, and, and if they found anything being said in the Quran that they could take issue with, they're going to take issue with it right away. So if the Prophet, peace be upon him, is standing up in public and reciting the Quran, which is what we know that he did, and he's saying, this is information from the unseen. Nobody knew it prior to this. Imagine that. He has to be sure that nobody in the crowd knows this. Because somebody from the back could easily stand up and say, Hey, excuse me, wait a minute, sir. You're saying that nobody knew this? But wait, I know a guy who knows this. <laughs> but, but nobody could challenge the Prophet, peace be upon him, on this score. Because if they did, the Quran would not get off the ground. We wouldn't be Muslims today. So specific information from the past. When one reads the Bible, one comes across a story about Musa alayhi and he and his people are being persecuted now by the Pharaoh. See in the movie, The Ten Commandments is played again and again every, every Christmas season. Charlton Heston, right? The movie was made several decades ago, but uh, you know, we get a chance to see it several times. So the, the waves, uh, the, the water opens and Musa alayhi salam and his people cross to safety. The Pharaoh comes and the, waves, the waters come together and Pharaoh and his army are drowned. In the biblical record, that's the end of the story. Pharaoh is drowned, no more. This story is shown so clearly in the book of Exodus chapter 15. And elsewhere in the Bible, when the story is reflected upon again, it is always the same. That's the end of the Pharaoh. In the Quran, on the other hand, in the 10th chapter, the story is told, among many other chapters, but here specifically, God addresses the Pharaoh at, at that moment when he is about to drown and says to him, Today we save you in terms of your body. We save you in your body so that you may be a sign for those who come later. Dr. Maurice Bouquet is a French scientist. He wrote a book entitled The Bible, the Quran, and Science. In the introduction, he explained that he came across some things in the Quran that, that were intriguing to him. And, and he could not rely on the English translations uh, alone. He wanted to get to the Arabic to see what it says in the original. So he studied the Arabic language for this purpose. And then he wrote his book, The Bible, the Quran, and Science, showing that when we compare the Quran with information which is known also from the Bible, and we compare the two together with science, we see that the Quran is always coming out ahead of the Bible. The Quran being in agreement with scientific discoveries Whereas the Bible, in fact, often falls short, not only with science, but also with history. And in this case, now we're talking about something of history. He says that he himself had a chance to examine the discovered body of the Pharaoh. The body was discovered in 1898 at Thebes in the King's Valley and was documented for the first time by Sir Elliot Smith in a book entitled The Royal Mummies, published in the year 1912. The body was kept in the Egyptian Museum 
it, until eventually it was moved uh, to Paris. And there, Dr. Bouquet had the opportunity to examine this body, and he said that the result of my investigation is that this person died either due to drowning or due to shock just preceding the drowning. So this body has been preserved and found and is now a sign for us. How is it a sign for us? Now if anyone goes to see that body, they will say, this is what happens to people who reject the message of God and actively plot against the, 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 the message of God. So it has, become, it has become a sign for those who come later. So the Quran is, is impressive in all of these different ways. So that's my fifth point so far. I'm going to go now to my sixth point. My sixth point is really about the Quran and its correspondence with science. We already hinted at that in the previous point, but now let's take it a step further. The Quran tells us that he, God is going to show us his signs in the heavens and also in ourselves until it becomes clear that this is the truth. Now the Quran calls our attention to the greatness of God and his majesty. The Quran calls our attention to our own humility and our humble beginnings. The point of the Quran is not to teach us science. There are other books that can teach us that. But the point of the Quran is to build our relationship with God. But in drawing our attention to the majesty of God and, and, and his creation, the Quran uses language and expressions, words, which from a modern scientific point of view is puzzling. How did somebody 1400 years ago say it in this way? It looks like that whoever said this, they knew some of the things which we are now discovering. For example, the idea that the universe is expanding is a relatively modern idea. In 1929, Edwin Hubble used his telescope to look into the distant uh, past, and he saw that the galaxies are moving away from each other at rapid speed. And what that meant is that if they're going farther away, they were closer together previously. And prior to that, closer still. And eventually, if we project our thoughts back, we reach a point of singularity where everything were together as one. And from there, the expansion occurred. The idea that the universe is expanding did not appeal to many scientists at the time because they're afraid of that singularity. If you project back to that singularity, then you, you have to ask, what started it all? How did this expansion occur? How, from a single point, did you get the entire universe unfolding? You've seen one of those greeting cards which, you know, I don't know if they make them anymore. When you open them, it starts to give you a musical tune, right? So you open it, and there's a musical tune. How did it get in there? Somebody had to put it in there, right? You don't just open any card, and then it starts to play a song for you. Somebody programmed it like this. How did the universe expand from a singularity without anybody doing the programming? So scientists didn't like this because it implied for them that there is a creator God. So they resisted the idea until 1964 when two scientists, Penzias and Wilson, uh, won the Nobel Prize for their discovery of what is called cosmic microwave background radiation. That is radiation that would have been emitted at the moment of the Big Bang some 13.8 billion years ago. So now, for, it was finally settled that the universe is expanding. What does the Quran say about this? In the 51st chapter of the Quran, in the 47th verse, this is Surah Al-Zariyat. I, I need to mention the name as well, because, you know, the number for, you know, those youth who want to go look it up, and they will go find it by number in the English translations. And then uh, the, the, the name, because this is how traditionally Muslims have referred to the surahs, not by numbers. And sometimes in a lecture I mention the number, and somebody comes up and says, hey, which surah is that? Because we don't know it by number. Tell us the name. So, Azariyat. In the 47th ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالسَّمَا بَنَيْنَاهَا بِأَيْدٍ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِعُونَ as for the heavens, we have created it with power 
and we are expanding it. 1400 years ago, the Quran already said that the universe is expanding. And that has become a staple now of modern times that we are living in an expanding universe. More can be said about this. But turning our eyes now from the cosmos, we want to look inward. Because the Quran says, we will show you our signs in the heavens and also in yourselves. What about in ourselves? The Quran describes the growth and development of the human baby. And now, of course, of course with ultrasound, you see how the baby develops. But imagine a time 1400 years ago when people did not have even the microscope. The microscope was invented a thousand years after the Quran came to be revealed. So if the Quran says something about the growth and development of the human baby right from the very inception, the question is, how did the Quran know these details? Anyone can guess a few things, right? You know, there's a baby in there growing. Eventually the baby is kicking, right? You know that. But look at what the Quran says. The Quran says that God created you from a nutfa, a tiny drop. And, and it even specifies more clearly, it says that it is from a solala, it's, it's from a selection out of ma'in maheen, out of a despised fluid. A selection. And now, when modern scientists study the, the, how conception takes place, they see it is actually one sperm out of so much that is emitted at one time, and it's only one, it is a selection. It is, as, as, it is as if the ovum opens up to receive that one. And when that one is received, the ovum closes. The others can't get in. So it is really a selection out of the entire body of fluid at that time. And the Quran is very accurate in saying that it is a selection. Moreover, the Quran says that from that nutfa, God made you into an alaka. Alaka in Arabic means a thing that clings. It is the same name for a leech that sticks to your foot if you stand in the swamps for too long in Guyana. <laughs> and, and what does the leech do? The leech is a blood sucker, right? Now, what does the, the human embryo, this baby, what does this baby do? This baby is going to embed itself into the uterine wall of the mother. And where does it get its blood from? From the mother. So it's acting, I don't want to use the term, but it's acting like that same leech. In, in fact, in, in scientific terms, they will say that the baby is a parasite. Uh, unfortunately, that's the scientific term. We, specifically, this is how they would say it. Uh, it. It's deriving all of its nourishment from the mother. And this is one of the miracles of life in that the body, human body, is trained, somehow programmed to reject parasites. We reject. Even if there is a transplant, sometimes the body rejects the transplant. You know that. The transplanted organ. Uh, yet, uh, the, 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 the mother's body accommodates this newly developing uh, baby. So it is a miracle, but that's, uh, that's not my point. My point is that the way in which the Quran describes this is accurate. That that's exactly what the human baby is at that very early stage. And then the Quran says that from that alaka, God made you into a mudra. Mudra is a thing that clings. Uh, sorry, a, a, a chewed lump. Mudra, a chewed lump. So if you take a morsel of flesh and you chew it a little bit, that's called a, a, a mudra. Dr. Maurice uh, Bouquet is one I mentioned previously. I'll mention another scientist now. He was professor uh, at the University of Toronto, Dr. Keith Moore. He wrote uh, textbooks on embryology, study of the growth and human development, uh, growth and development of the human baby, embryology. He wrote textbooks on embryology which are studied in universities throughout the Western world. He said that when he came across this Quranic description, he was intrigued by it. He took a plasticine model of the human embryo and bit into it to form teeth marks and he showed by comparison that with the teeth marks on that chewed lump, it is very similar in outward appearance to the human embryo at 28 days old. He can show the two side by side. Because the somites are forming, looking like backbone, and it has, it's almost like teeth marks one after another, the two images correspond in this way. 
So the, this, the accuracy of this uh, Quranic term is quite amazing. Especially when you consider that at 28 days old, the human embryo is only the size of a grain of rice. So even if something was aborted at that time, and one saw it, one wouldn't know what he or she is looking at. You wouldn't differentiate between this and the rest of the aborted material. How would you know to describe it like this? How did this information get into the Quran if the Quran is only from the mind of a man who lived some 1400 years ago? Our answer is that this is not from his mind. This is a revelation from the Almighty God given into the mind of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And that was my, what point? Six points so far, right? Get to the seventh point, and that's all the time we'll have for in this lecture because we want to get on with the rest of this evening's program as well. My seventh point comes from the area of mathematics. You know, everyone has uh, their own special interest, uh, and some people like this subject, some people like the other subject, some people like math, uh, some people hate math, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, some people who love math have been looking into the Quran from a mathematical point of view in modern times. And now it becomes possible for us to do calculations based on data that are there in the Quran, because we have computer equipment, we can feed the Quranic data into our computer software and we can count things. Now, when, when somebody is giving a message, then they, they don't count the words that they're using. For example, if I tell you the story of my life, uh, as you know, probably know by now, I was born in Guyana. And uh, when I was growing up as a, youth, as a youth in Guyana, at first I had no I inclination that I would ever come to Toronto. Uh, but, uh, you know, things were getting tough in Guyana. My brother had migrated. He had uh, taken up residence in Toronto. And uh, eventually he sponsored my parents. I was only 16 at the time, so I came up as a minor under my parents' uh, sponsorship. And this is how I've uh, arrived in Toronto. Well, how many times did I say Toronto. You see, you were absorbed with the message, right? And you were not counting. And I was not counting either. So I don't even know how many times I mentioned Toronto. I only know that I was deliberately mentioning a lot, mentioning it a lot because I wanted to test you. <laughs> but not so much to test you, but to prove the point. The point is that when you hear the message, you don't count the words. Even if you ask a hafiz of the Quran, how many times a certain word occurs in the Quran, if it's a few times, maybe he will recall the few times, he, but he will have to you know, think about it for a little while, and then maybe he can tell you the few times. But if we're dealing with a large number, there's no way he's going to remember. He can recite the whole thing from beginning to end, but if you stop him in between somewhere, he gets confused. Now he has to start from the beginning again in order to get the surah right. Now imagine the Prophet ﷺ going about in a period, over a period of 23 years, people ask him questions, and the questions are mentioned in the Quran. The Quran says, Yes, Alunak, they're asking you, and here's the question. Call, say to them, and here is the answer. So both the question and the answer are there in the Quran. He could not predict ahead of time what people are going to ask him. Something is going to happen. There's going to be a war. There's going to be a marriage. And he gives some commentary or instruction uh, to deal with that situation. As the situation arises, he cannot control in advance what is going to be said or what needs to be said. So the information is just simply coming into his mind and he is reciting it uh, as if somebody is in a trance. He comes out of the trance and then he starts to recite these uh, words and his followers memorize the words, write them down on whatever materials are available. And then quickly after his death, they try to compile all of these materials so that they, they will not be lost forever. So now with this process in mind, uh, it, nobody was doing any counting then how do you explain the fact that certain words occur in the Quran a number of times which are itself meaningful? The number becomes meaningful. For example, the Quran mentions the word shahr in Arabic, which means month, in the singular, exactly 12 times. Is that a mere coincidence? Or was somebody counting how many times to use month in this book, you know, from beginning to end? Now, every child here knows that there are 12 months in a year, right? So if the Quran said there are 12 months in a year, which the Quran actually says, that's nothing special. Any book can say that. Any child can say that. But the question is, if you pick up a book, any book, here is a book, pick up this book, how many times does this book mention months? If it comes out to be 12, that would be a rare coincidence. How many times does this other book mention months? If it mentions months tw exactly 12 times, that's going to be a rare coincidence. And if it's just the one, you might say, okay, it's a rare coincidence, but coincidences happen, right? But it's not just that. 
How many times does the word day in the singular occur in the Quran? The word yawm in the Quran, which means day, without any suffixes, occurs in the Quran exactly 365 times. And now we can count it because we have modern computer uh, equipment. We can feed the data into the computer and find out how many times does this word occur. Uh, how many times does this word occur? And that's 365. So now we have a double coincidence. The word for, for month in the singular, 12 times. The word for day in the singular, exactly 365 times. And because this number is so large, uh, how did it get precisely at 365? Some words are used in contrast with each other or in comparison and the numbers occur an equal number of times For example the words for hot and cold four times each in the Quran the word for man and woman Rajul in Arabic and Imra'a for Rajul for man Imra'a for woman each occurs 24 times in the Quran and they're scattered throughout. It's not like they're always together. If the Quran always said man and woman, man and woman, man and woman, of course they're going to come out even, Stephen, right? But if some places mention man and do not mention woman, and some other places mention uh, woman but do not mention man, the question is who was doing the counting? Now, we mentioned Jesus earlier, right? Isa alayhi salam is mentioned by name 25 times in the Quran. And Adam is also mentioned 25 times by name in the Quran. And the Quran says, In the Masala Isa, in the Allahi Kamasali Adam. The example of Jesus in the sight of God is like the example of Adam. Seldom do they get mentioned in the same surah. Only once are they mentioned in the same verse, the same one verse I just mentioned. So who was doing the counting? 25 times each. We always compare uh, and, and contrast shaitan and malaika, right? Shaitan, evil force, devil, uh, malaika, good forces, angels, right? How many times do these words occur in the Quran? Shaitan, 88 times. Malaika, also 88 times. We contrast this life and the life hereafter. This life is dunya in Arabic. The life hereafter, akhirah. How many times do these words occur in the Quran? Dunya, 115 times. Akhirah, 115 times also. So who was doing the counting? For the Prophet, peace be upon him, to have done this, if you want to imagine that he was a human being producing this book on his own, he would have to have something like a computer mind. He would have to open his mind into something like a Microsoft Excel worksheet program. It would have to have like a number of uh, rows, one for each verse of the Quran, a number of columns, one for month, one for day, one for hot, one for cold, one for man, one for woman, one for... Uh, and you get the picture. Every time he recites a verse, he puts it there in one row. If it mentions Adam, he clicks one in the Adam column. If it mentions Shaitan, he clicks one in the Shaitan column. And then he has to keep his mind on the numbers at the bottom to make sure that they're coming out right. To say that the Prophet, peace be upon him, did this is really to assume too much and it's really to deny the obvious that what we are dealing with here is a man who said that this is a revelation given to him by the Almighty God and indeed it is a revelation given to him by the Almighty God. It is not simply coming out of his own mind, uh, but it is a message of God to all of us. Now as much as we delight in this information, we ourselves now have a responsibility as Muslims. We have the responsibility to convey this message to that engineering uh, professor. We have a, a responsibility to convey this message uh, to our neighbors. We have a responsibility to convey this message to the person sitting beside us on the bus. And we have a responsibility to live according to this message. Because what is the use of saying, Oh, mashallah, we have such a wonderful book. But if we're not going to follow that book. So we have a responsibility to follow this message. And of course, Ramadan is coming up in about five weeks, you told me. And that means that we should be getting ready uh, to fulfill one of the commandments of this book. To fast in the month of Ramadan. And also to recite this book during that holy month. But of course, we don't have to wait for that special month. We can start reciting this book, ponder over, pondering over its meanings and putting it into practice in our very lives. Wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is tolerant, even if we are not. Uh, he knows people, he knows their circumstances, 
And uh, we might think that it's simple enough that the one faith will be good for everybody in the world, uh, but uh, we see that in reality it doesn't work that way. That uh, people hold on to what they believe, they support and defend uh, what they believe, and if you attack what they believe by showing them that what they believe is wrong, they defend it all the more. It, it's part of human nature. And it happens among Muslims as well. If you find two Muslims of two different persuasions, like one is following one particular view of Islam and the other one is following the other view, see the clashes between them and how, how insistently they defend what they believe in. So if, if two Muslims cannot decide on, on the singular truth, imagine when we go outside of Islam, when somebody has been brought up in another religion and they hear about the religion of Islam, how strange this must feel to them and how difficult it is for them to accept the truth. We said previously, like it or lump it. Some people, for some people, you know, a pill, even though useful to them, might be too big for them to swallow. They just can't handle it. So. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves people as they are, but He still gives them the air to breathe. He still gives them the sunlight. He still provides for them all of the amenities of life. He still cures them when they are ill, and so on. Uh, so the miracles can happen outside of uh, Islam as well, and it is all from Allah azza wa jal, uh, when, when it is uh, in this particular way that we, we have added the caution from the beginning that not all such miracles are uh, you know, with divine approval. Some uh, may be coming through uh, devilish uh, forces, and we need to be aware of that as well. Jazakallah khair. Um, next question is, what are some simple proofs or arguments, you could say, uh, that Allah exists? Okay, so uh, on the question, does, does God exist? Uh, we, we should be clear that uh, the, the responsibility is both ways. It's not only that we have to prove that God exists, but if somebody is claiming that there is no God, they need to prove that as well. And in fact, nobody can prove that. Nobody can prove that God does not exist. You know, if, uh, if, if I didn't see Sheikh Shazad here, but if I found his jacket hanging outside, I would say he is here. Maybe he's in the bathroom, maybe he went upstairs, uh, and I would be searching. And maybe while I was going upstairs, maybe he came downstairs by a different route. You see? So to prove that he does, he's not here, th this is rather difficult. Now, how are you going to prove that God does not exist? Where are you going to search? You're going to go to Mars? You're going to go to Jupiter? You're going to go outside of our galaxy? Uh, where are you going to search to, to prove that God does not exist? So those who say that God does not exist, they are saying this as an inference. This is what they infer. They infer from the fact that they have never seen God, nobody has ever seen God, uh, they're saying, okay, well, God does not exist. Or they may say, look at all of the suffering in the world. If God existed, God would have removed all of this suffering. So therefore, God does not exist. And our answer to them would be that though God exists, He has good reasons for allowing suffering in the world. And He has good reasons for not showing Himself. One of the good reasons that God may have for not showing himself in the way that, you know, we appear, uh, first of all, is that what would God look like? Sometimes somebody says, okay, if God uh, exists, let him show himself on TV. So that means you think that God is going to appear like a human being on TV. You think that God looks like a human being. Now, let's say God doesn't look like a human being, but in order to appear on TV, he's going to make himself like a human being. So now, what you're seeing on TV is a human being. How do you know he's God? <laughs> you see? So, uh, the, the very proposition that God should appear to us to, to begin with is preposterous. Now, on the other hand, we have good reasons for believing that there is a God. Remember, we talked about the singularity. When, when, when we project back and we realize that the universe popped into existence from that singularity, we realize that there has to be a God who put it all into motion. There are physical constants. This is my second point. That, that, that would, I, I would classify that as a first point. The first point is what uh, science, uh, our the theologians or philosophers refer to as, theologians and philosophers refer to this as the cosmological argument. Like the cosmos has to have a, a cause of its beginning. The second point I would make is uh, about the design that we notice in nature. Uh, we live in, uh, you know, I, I talked about mathematics with regards to the Quran. Uh, scientists have found that the universe also contains mathematical patterns. And, and that calls for a designer. Who is the grand mathematician that worked out all of the numbers that we have in our universe? 
You know why we experience the, uh, the, the lunar eclipse? Uh, we, we experience that because uh, the, the, the moon uh, comes in between us and the sun. And it so happens that the sun is 400 times greater in size than the moon. And it is also 400 times the distance away. So what happens is that when there is an alignment, the, 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 the moon comes in between us and the sun, and from our vision, point of view, the moon completely blocks the, the disk of the sun, but no more than the disk. And what that leaves is that there is a halo around the sun that is still visible, but the sun is not. And that's what creates this beautiful eclipse. You see, the math has been worked out, but, but not by us, and not by chance, but by some grand mathematician. This is only one example of the mathematics in the universe. So there's design in the universe, and that calls for a designer. I mean, we can add more, but I'll leave the point at that. All right, I think um, maybe take one more. We can sure. leave the time for the dinner, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, Non-Muslims, or some non-Muslims, you could say, call, say that Allah is the devil or a deceiver. Uh, the question, maybe this is a second question, but who creates good and bad and evil? Uh, this is a question that uh, people uh, struggle with. Like, what is the origin of evil? Uh, because if, if you say that God is good, well, he should have done everything good. And where does the evil come from? Uh, and uh, nobody has a, a perfect answer for this, uh, but it has been debated for a long time. The Zoroastrians thought uh, that there, were, there must be two forces, a good force and an evil force. Uh, and so they have this kind of dualism. In the Bible, uh, it's clearly cl uh, it is cl stated clearly in the book of Isaiah that God creates evil. And uh, that is an idea that is uh, both in, in Judaism, in Christianity, and also in Islam. That everything actually goes back to the one God, who is the source of all goodness, but for some good reasons, he permits uh, or even creates what we call uh, evil. Uh, so uh, we ask God, for example, in uh, Surah Al-Falaq. Al-Falaq min sharima khalaq. Uh, we are asking refuge in the Lord of daybreak from the evil that he created. So he created some evil, but for good purposes. Our scholars say that uh, the things that we describe as evil that we observe uh, are not absolutely evil. They're there for some good ultimate reason, but from our point of view, they look evil. And uh, to understand different points of view, let's say you're planning a picnic and it rains on that day. You will say it's bad that it's rain, right? The rain came at an inopportune time, uh, inopportune time. But let's say you're a farmer waiting for your crops to grow and you need rain for your crops. So the rain comes in, you say this fortunate, I got rain today, alhamdulillah. So somebody is praising Allah because they got rain, but for the same rain, somebody else is saying, why did God rain on my picnic? <laughs> you see? So it's a matter of perspective sometimes. And because we don't see the whole picture, things appear to be very bad. And, and I, I, I don't want to minimize this. You know, if you're suffering from something, you've got a, 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 you know, excruciating pain uh, and uh, an aggravated illness, then it doesn't help much to say, you know, to hear from somebody else that maybe there's some good in this. But there is good. Even, so, uh, you know, if, we learn in the hadith that if a believer suffers anything, even to the extent that a thorn uh, pierces your, your toe, uh, that too, if you remain patient about that, is uh, good for you because you get reward for the patience. So that works out for you good in the, in the long run. So in the end, all of this comes from God. We say that all of it is from God. That's why we say, Aman to billahi wa, wa malaikati and so on. And then we say, and, and the determination of all good and bad, all of this is from Allah Ta'ala. That's what we're saying. That is uh, our belief. But he allows the evil or creates it for some good ultimate purpose. Even if you think of the shaitan, he's as evil as you can imagine, right? But that serves a good purpose as well. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala allowed him to disobey and to try to mislead people. 
But in his attempts to mislead people, there is some good. Let's take the simple case of your salat. So you're trying to pray, and you have to pray four rakats, and by the time you've done the third one, you can't remember, did I do two or three? You get to the fourth, and you're still puzzled. So what do you do? The Prophet ﷺ said, this is shaitan trying to confuse you. So what you do is you consider it to be the lesser number that's in your mind. It's either three or four, okay, make it three. Now add one more, so you've done four. Now you're sure you've done the required number. Then at the end, you perform two extra prostrations, right? Now, what does the extra rakat do if indeed you have added one more in this process? It's hurtful unto shaitan because in this rakat, you are reading Quran, you are bowing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He doesn't like that too much. Even if you have arrived now at the correct number by adding the two prostrations, what have you done to him? You are again uh, causing him hurt because you are prostrating before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not once but twice. He doesn't like that too much. So while he is trying to mislead the believer, the believer is actually getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his uh, acts are always being frustrated. And in the end, it is through his acts sometimes that the believer draws close to Allah uh, th This point might be uh, more clearly and quickly illustrated with a story from the Gospels. It said that a woman came in and, and she was so obviously devout uh, to God uh, because uh, he, Jesus declared to her that she is uh, forgiven. And uh, Isa alayhi salam then said that she loves God much because she has been forgiven much. She loves God much because she has been forgiven much. Imagine a person who thinks that he or she is all righteous and thinks I'm serving God and uh, no blemish on me. God has to give me paradise. That, that's arrogance, right? That's not the religious attitude. But imagine a person who was a sinner. And this person can recount all of the sins of his life. He was drinking, he was gambling, he was fornicating and all of that. And now he had a turnaround in his life. And he feels that Allah has forgiven me. I prayed on that Laylatul Qadr and I was so sincere in my prayer. And I felt something in me like now I am whole. And now I'm, I've turned a new page in life. Now I love Allah Azawajal. What do you think about this person? This person is going to love Allah more than that person who is thinking, I never sinned. Nothing to answer for on the day of judgment. I have everything right. See, that person is arrogant. Actually, if he says he loves Allah, I doubt it. But this other person who was a sinner before and turned his life around, when he says he loves Allah, I believe it. Because it is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that turned him around, that took him out of that uh, wayward life and brought him onto the right path. Yeah? So through the actions of the shaitan, this man was being misled and now he has turned back and he loves Allah all the more because of the actions of the shaitan. So even though shaitan is trying to, uh, to thwart the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is actually feeding into the plan of Allah despite himself. So the evils that are allowed to exist are there for a good reason. We cannot foresee all of the good reasons, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his master plan has got it all worked out. So, so we close at this point and Sheikh Shazad will direct us about what comes next. All right, assalamu alaikum everyone. Zakla Khaid, Dr. Shabir Ali for a beautiful lecture. I benefited greatly, inshallah you all as well. Um, a lot of numbers and, and hopefully uh, questions answered. A lot of the questions there, I really wanted to ask them. They were really good, but due to the, the shortness of time, you know, we got to <laughs> close up, inshallah. So again, may Allah bless you all for coming out. Uh, the youth group really appreciates it. They all came early. They set up the tables. They, they got this, even this, tape, this head tablecloth sewn. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> mashallah. And uh, I thank everyone for, for coming out and helping. Um, uh, even though sometimes we might think um, someone else will come to the dinner and support the youth, right? Uh, it was a free dinner, alhamdulillah, you know? Um, mashallah, they're doing a good job. The amount of appreciation that we got that day at the previous dinner, subhanAllah, was amazing. But I know it runs through people's minds sometimes that mashallah, they're doing a good job, but you know, I can't make it, somebody else will go. Every individual is important. Everyone is important here. And so inshallah, we really look forward to seeing you guys again at the next coming dinner inshallah on June 4th. Inshallah, that's just uh, 
It could be just the day before Ramadan and it's be by Sheikh Muslih Khan and it's going to be about Ramadan. So preparing for Ramadan pretty much. We're, they're titling the lecture, um, Are You Ready? Are You Ready for Ramadan? So again, uh, thank you all for coming out. We, we appreciate your support. May Allah bless you all. So we'll end the program, inshallah. ربنا أعطينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. The food إن شاء الله will start being served at the back إن شاء الله. You all can help yourselves. جزاك الله خير. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. All people come to him, come to the way of Sultan Rabia, most honored one and most glorified one, most praised one in divine presence, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Beautiful, all things beautiful. Game.